We can go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone, and good afternoon. My name is Christine Lee, and I'm with CalCoS Credit Union. And as you may know, CalCoS Credit Union is the longest serving financial institution in San Diego. And the credit union was started by teachers in 1929. And since the beginning, our vision has been to foster a culture of service and commitment to our community. And we're passionate about providing valuable resources and tools to our membership members to help achieve financial prosperity. So to that end, I'm excited to welcome you to today's financial wellness webinar on the topic of estate planning 101. And just before we dive in, I'd like to mention that everyone will be placed on mute. However, during the presentation, if you do have questions, please utilize the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And presentation questions will be addressed by Jason Young, team lead of member support at Trust and Will, who's based out of Mississippi. And should you have any CalCoast related questions, Either myself or my colleague, Tim Feria, who is our Senior Business Development Officer, will be sure to address those questions. And last but not least, we are recording this session. So if you'd like to go back and review any of the information that will be presented today, you can do so by visiting the CalCoS Credit Union YouTube channel. All right, so we have some important information to share today. So let's go ahead and get started. I am pleased to introduce our esteemed presenter, Molly Peters. Molly is the Senior Content Manager at Trust and Will, and she, along with her team, oversees the development, distribution, and strategic efforts of all content messaging. And she's based right here in San Diego and loves spending her free time at the beach with her dog, Annie. Molly, thank you so much for joining us, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Yes, you may hear Annie barking in the background. That's the work from home life. So if you hear that, that's who that is. Um, yes, welcome everyone today to Estate Planning 101. As mentioned, I am your host today, Molly Peter, Senior Content Manager at Trust and Will. And today we'll be discussing the basics of estate planning. So We'll start by first defining what an estate plan is, what it does, and then we'll cover some of the key documents in an estate plan and how to decide which documents are best for you. And then finally, we'll conclude with who needs an estate plan, some of the common reasons it might be time to create, or if you already have your plan, update it and how you can get started doing so. And as Christine mentioned, don't forget if you have any questions along the way, we highly encourage you to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Jason is an expert and he will be here to help answer any questions you may have. So let's dive in. What is estate planning? Estate planning is planning for today for what happens tomorrow. So at the very most basic level, an estate plan lets you make decisions today about what should happen if you're ever unable to make decisions for yourself in the future. So it's really just a set of instructions where you can say what you want to happen to your assets, your belongings, your physical body. So do you want to be buried? Do you want to be cremated? What kind of funeral type do you want? A traditional funeral, a celebration of life memorial? These are the types of decisions you can make in your estate plan. So why should someone care about estate planning or what should motivate someone to want to create their estate plan? This is one of my favorite questions to answer because there are so many reasons to care. Um, first and foremost is peace of mind. The peace of mind that comes from creating your estate plan really is priceless. You'll feel confident that you've taken the necessary steps to protect yourself and your loved ones. And you can rest easy at night knowing that you have a plan in place for what should happen if something ever goes wrong. And having a plan also um, avoids leaving your loved ones with that, what to do, what should I do? How would this person want this handled when they're already in that difficult time of grieving? Um, another major reason to prioritize your estate planning is so that you can name legal guardians to care for your minor children and your pets. So knowing that your children 
and your fluffier children too will be safe and in the right hands should the worst happen to you, should also bring you that peace of mind. And the third reason estate planning is so important is that it can help you prepare for potential incapacity during your lifetime. That's right, estate planning isn't just for after you pass away. In fact, a lot of studies show that Americans will be, uh, will be impacted by incapacity, either their own or a loved one's during their lifetime. And having a plan in place can be critical in ensuring whatever is your desired outcome. And like I mentioned, it can also make it easier for your family and your friends to respect whatever wishes you've set in advance. And many people often overlook that key factor, the importance of the incapacity planning, because they only think of estate planning as what happens at death. But I've had a lot of experiences where those same people go through the process of creating their estate plan and wind up thinking that the incapacity planning portion is what matters to them most. But we'll get into that a little bit later when we talk about your healthcare documents. So with estate planning, these are inherently personal decisions that you're making. And so there's no easy way to have a default rule that matches whatever your desires are. And there's obviously no certainty that anyone else would make the same decisions that you would make for yourself. So when it comes to estate planning, there's a couple things to think about. Asset distribution and business succession planning. So asset distribution is the primary motivation for a lot of people, and it's the ability to control where your assets and belongings will go after you die. So your family, a lot of people choose to leave their assets or belongings to their family and loved ones, but you can also donate those things to charity or support organizations that or causes that matter to you during your lifetime. And it can also help you to minimize taxes to maximize the benefit to your beneficiaries. So a lot of people equate estate planning with this asset, asset distribution and that certainly plays a large part, but asset distributions are not the end-all be-all of estate planning. There's succession planning, there's end-of-life planning, there's that incapacity planning, which relates to your healthcare documents, all of which we'll cover later on in this webinar. But a quick touch on business succession planning. This is often overlooked by individuals who have their own business, whether it's a small business, a big business, but business succession Planning is critical to ensure that your business doesn't just evaporate after your death because the absence of a plan can lead to a loss of valuation of your business, which can heavily impact and likely significantly decrease the inheritance you want to leave to your beneficiaries. So now we've got the why down, but what really is an estate plan? So at its most basic level, an estate plan is a set of documents containing instructions for what should happen if you cannot speak for yourself, whether you are incapacitated or have died. So an estate plan is typically multiple documents, not just one, but the documents in your estate plan will vary person to person, but should be tailored to meet your specific needs and goals. Each type of document in your estate plan is designed to do one thing, so your plan might focus on just one of two, one or two of these things, in which case your estate plan would only be one or two documents. Or your plan might be more comprehensive with a full suite of documents. But for today's purposes, the most typical documents are wills, trusts, and then your healthcare documents. So let's dive into each of those. What is a will? Your last will and testament is a legal document that controls most of your assets when you die, and it doesn't go into effect until after your death. So what's the purpose of a will? A will handles fundamental needs for everyone. So therefore, if you're at least 18 years or older, a will can benefit you. The three primary functions of your will are one, to determine who will receive your assets after you die. So that goes back to the asset distribution. Secondly, to nominate guardians for your children and pets. And then lastly, to specify those final arrangements. So like I mentioned, do you want a traditional funeral, a memorial? Do you want to be buried, cremated, another option? Those things are all addressed in your final arrangements. 
So the next question a lot of people have is what happens if I die and I don't have a will? So this is called dying in testacy or dying with no will. Like I said, the functions of a will are absolutely essential. And these are matters who will get your things, how will your assets be distributed that have to be addressed, whether you have a will or not. So what happens is your state's specific laws will fill in the gaps and make those decisions for you, which leads to a huge common misunderstanding is that many people assume that the default state laws will give them the result they would have wanted, but that is not always the case. For example, let's say you're married and have two kids. Your state's laws may provide that your assets are divided one third to each person, one third to your spouse, one third to kid one, one third to kid two. But maybe you don't want your kids to receive one third of your assets after you die. Or maybe your spouse would be unable to maintain the house or their standard of living with only one third of your assets at that, at that time. But depending on your state's laws, this is what could happen if you die into state. But when you have a legally binding will in place, the court is far more likely to honor your wishes as you present in your will. So now let's talk a little bit more about how a will works after your death. So plain and simple, all wills go through probate. And probate is a judicial process to determine the validity of your will and also to appoint an executor. So if you don't have a will and you did not appoint an executor, the court will appoint an administrator to perform the same functions as your executor would. This is usually a relative, but if you have no will, it may not be the relative that you would have chosen to make those important decisions. So to further clarify, the role of an executor is to manage the administration of your will, meaning they'll collect your assets, they'll pay any debts, expenses, and taxes associated with your estate, and then ultimately, they'll be the one to distribute your assets to your chosen beneficiaries. But this is a long process because probate is very undesirable. It's extremely slow. It can take up to 12 to 18 months, for example, in California. And that was before COVID. So now it's expected to take 24 months plus as courts start to reopen. It's also just difficult and stressful. It's a process that begins immediately after death. And that's obviously during a time where your family and loved ones will be grieving and in that period of loss. So it can often bring out resentments and lead to familial disputes, which nobody wants. And probate is really expensive. For example, a million dollar estate can cost up to $50,000 in statutory fees for probate in California. And that 1 million includes the house and its gross value, not the equity that's been accumulated. So if more money is going to probate fees, that means less money that's going to your beneficiaries. So probate avoidance is a huge motivator for a lot of people to create their estate plan. And also one of the primary reasons that a lot of people will look into a trust. So let's talk about what a trust is. A trust is a legal agreement between three parties. There's the settler, also known as the trustor or grantor, and they are who creates the trust and puts property into it. Then there is the trustee who holds and manages the assets in the trust. And then there's the beneficiary who the trust is in favor of. So essentially the settler creates a trust, gives the assets to the trustee to hold for the beneficiary. So in a lot of cases, the settler, trustee, and beneficiary are all the same person initially. Think about it. You create the trust. You're the settler. You are managing the assets in the trust during your lifetime as the trustee. And during your lifetime, you are benefiting from the trust. But obviously, these roles can, can split and will split, particularly after death. Um, and then depending on the type of trust that you do have, these roles can shift during your lifetime as well. So there are five primary purposes of a trust. First is to avoid probate. And that's key for many people. A trust is an easy way to avoid or mitigate all of those negative consequences that I just talked about that come with probate. 
but trust is not just about probate avoidance. Um, it also is a way to manage and distribute your assets like a will, but a trust gives you more control over when and how your assets are distributed because you can add certain contingencies into your trust, which I'll give an example on that later. Um, thirdly, and trust applies during your lifetime and after death, which means a trust can be useful in planning for incapacity and ensure that there's a seamless transition of control. Also, a trust provide for your family. This is a really big motivator for a lot of people who have younger children or blended families because trusts are what give you more control over the assets that will eventually benefit your younger children. Um, trusts also give you more control over providing for your spouse during his or her lifetime, but then ensuring that the assets pass to your children after your spouse's death. And a trust can help minimize taxes, which is a benefit for a lot of people as well. So what's the role of a trustee? You can think of a trustee like the CEO of your trust. Obviously, it's bound by law and the terms of your trust, but it's still a very critical role as it's the person managing the assets in your trust. A trustee can work with other professionals or trusted advisors in your network, but they are the person managing your trust. So when you're choosing who you want your trustee to be, you obviously need it to be someone you can trust, no pun intended. Um, Someone who you truly believe has the ability to carry out the duties associated with the trust. So oftentimes it's the person's spouse. It can be their elder children, relatives, close friends. Um, you can also choose to have a professional trustee, which is a person you would, would hire. And that is their, their job is to act as trustee for people's trust. So that's an option as well. So now let's talk about a couple different types of trusts. There's a ton of different types of trusts, more so than what you can even see on my screen, but we'll talk about the most, in, uh, well, the most common ones. So a revocable living trust is the most commonly used type of trust. If you're thinking about a trust, you're thinking about a revocable living trust. So these are created while you're living. They can be changed or revoked and they avoid probate. Next is the testamentary trust, which is less commonly used. It is created under your will, and so it's only effective at death. These are a little bit easier to create, but typically still do require that probate process. Then there are other types of trusts, and choosing these just kind of depends on the complexity of your estate and what your goals and needs are. So there's certain types of trusts that are used for tax planning, like credit shelter trusts, what's called a Q-tip marital trust, an irrevocable life insurance trust. These are all specifically used for tax planning. And then there's trusts that are used for other purposes. So there's a special needs trust, there's asset protection trusts, there's Medicaid planning trusts. So a revocable living trust is the most common. However, depending on what your future goals are, what you're looking for, there's likely a trust to accommodate that need. So what are the differences between trusts and wills? There's a lot of similarities. There's a lot of differences, but it's first important to note that these are not alternatives of one another. If you have a will, that doesn't mean you don't need a trust. If you have a trust, that doesn't mean you shouldn't have a will. These both each document does something that the other does not. So there are similarities. Yes, they both dispose of your assets. But the key difference is trusts avoid probate. Wills go through probate. Trusts give you greater control over when and how your assets are distributed. Wills can be easier to set up. Trusts do take a little bit more work. Trusts apply during your lifetime and can help you plan for incapacity, whereas wills don't go into effect until after your death. Wills nominate guardians um, for your children and pets, and they can also specify your final arrangement wishes, which a trust does not do. But a trust is usually paired with a will as a set, which makes a very comprehensive bulletproof estate plan. 
So when should somebody consider a trust? Like I mentioned, um, those with younger children often consider a trust because rather than having, because of those contingencies I was talking about. So rather than having all of your kids um, or sorry, all of your assets go to your kids immediately when they turn 18 or immediately after you die, a trust lets you set triggers for asset distribution. So these can be things like age, life events, and, and these help stretch out those distributions. So let's say you don't want your child to receive their inheritance until after they go to college or after they turn 35, whatever those may be, you can set those contingencies to help stretch out distributions. People who also have more complex family dynamics, blended families, second marriages, often opt for a trust because trusts can let you benefit your spouse for their lifetime, but then ensure that your assets go to your children. Perhaps you want a majority of your assets to go to children from your first marriage versus your second, things like that. Um, a third reason some people like to opt for a trust is because wills do become public after you die. All wills are public records. You can go find any person who has died's will, but trusts stay private. Um, and then third, or lastly, people with higher asset levels often opt for a trust because again, it avoids probate. So if you're avoiding probate, you're saving all that money in probate fees. Um, and because probate fees are from a percent of your estate, if you have a very large estate, you're going to be paying more in probate fees. Um, also helps estate and income tax minimization. So currently the federal tax, the federal estate tax is set at $11.58 million, but that could always reduce, kind of depends on, it can, it can reduce. <laughs> Um, and then also just the opportunity for more advanced planning, because there are so many different types of trusts. There's a lot of um, options for that can differ depending on your needs and goals. And then lastly, stretching out retirement distribution. So if you have retirement savings that you plan to leave to your beneficiaries, a trust may provide a more tax advantageous way to distribute those retirement savings over time. So now we've covered wills and trusts. Let's talk about the third most common type of estate planning documents, and those are your healthcare documents. So your healthcare documents are three different documents, the power of attorney, the healthcare directive, and the HIPAA authorization. So power of attorney, super important. It's a person. So power of attorney, to clarify, is a document, and it is also a person. So your power of attorney document appoints your power of attorney. So that can get a little confusing. But in this document, you're designating someone to make any financial and non-medical decisions for you. So typically they come, their role comes into play um, and is used in the event of incapacity, but they can also be used and your person can step up in various other ways. For example, let's say you are buying a new home and you're out of the country and unable to sign a really important document that you need to close on the sale of your home, your power of attorney can step in and sign that document for you. Um, document number two is the living will, also known as a healthcare directive. So your living will is different from your last will and testament, the will that we've been talking about thus far. And in your living will or healthcare directive, you specify your own medical preferences in advance. And you also designate a person to make other medical decisions for you in the case you're unable to do so. So you'll set preferences like whether or not you want a DNR or to be an organ donor or specify the levels of medical care that you want in case of incapacity. And then lastly is the HIPAA authorization. So the HIPAA authorization ensures that the designated agents that you've appointed and those representatives can actually speak with your medical providers on your behalf. They can make decisions if you're unable to do so. They can consider costs of treatment. Um, and this is often frequently overlooked, but it's actually of utmost importance because if you have your living will, but you don't have your HIPAA authorization, the person that you've appointed may not be able to make decisions like you would have wanted them to or communicate with your medical providers. 
So now we've covered all the most important documents in an estate plan. So let's talk about um, who can benefit from an estate plan. I feel like you should all realize by now that everyone can benefit from an estate plan. All adults need one. If you're over the age of 18, which I'm pretty sure all of us here today are, you should think about setting up your estate plan. There are common reasons or life triggers that often um, get people to create their plans. So getting married, having children, accumulating more assets, those who have medical concerns, um, those who may have just lost a loved one and saw what they went through and kind of triggers them to say, oh, maybe I need to set up a plan. And then also those approaching retirement. So let's say you already have an estate plan. That's great. You're doing better than 60% of Americans, but your estate plan does need to be reviewed. So when should you update your estate plan? Your estate plan should evolve as your life changes. So you need to update your plan um, as your needs change. Perhaps you need to update your beneficiaries, change the guardians you've appointed for your children. As your kids get older, the guardians you chose for them when they're babies, you may want those to change. Um, and then just different preferences. You're going to have different preferences throughout your lifetime, and you need to ensure that as those preferences change, you update your estate plan to reflect those things. So some of the common triggers of when you should think about updating your estate plan are those same life events that should trigger you to create your estate plan. So any new births in the family, deaths in the family, if you have a change in marital status, if you're approaching retirement, and then really just the passage of time. Every three to five years is a good time to just revisit your plan. Whether you make updates or not, it's going to be up to you, but it is important just to lay eyes on it and ensure that all of those preferences you made when you set up your plan are the same today. And then also as your children, your minor children become adults, they'll need their own estate plans. When your kid is under 18, you have parental rights, but once your child turns 18, they should have legal documents set up to allow you to act on their behalf. So we've covered what an estate plan is, why it's so important to have one, but how should you go about putting a plan in place? So of course, there's the old fashioned route of finding a local estate planning attorney, um, but there's also options like trust and will, which provide you the tools to create your own estate plan. I may be a little bit biased, but I like that option a little better than going the old fashioned route. Um, so how can trust and will help? We were born from the recognition that the traditional way of creating a, an estate plan was not really working. The process is extremely expensive. It's inaccessible. It's confusing. It's intimidating for a lot of people. So a lot of people just didn't put a plan in place or they had put one in place, but it was extremely outdated because you have to go through that process again in order to update your plan. So um, we really just embraced technology and developed an easy and affordable way to create a high quality, fully customized, fully customized documents that are on par with those traditionally created by attorneys. Um, in many ways, we like to think of ourselves as like the turbo tax of estate planning. So we offer um, several different products. We have our will-based estate plan, which covers a wide range of needs, including healthcare documents. Um, so the power of attorney, healthcare directive, and HIPAA authorization, and then our trust-based estate plan, which is our most comprehensive plan. It gives you those tax planning benefits, allows you to plan for younger children, helps you avoid probate, and also includes all the documents that come with your will. So your will and those healthcare documents. So how can you get started with Trust and Will? Simply visit our website, trustandwill.com. And then from there, if you're not sure which type of plan is best for you, um, we have a really quick, simple quiz that'll ask you a few basic questions about yourself, like, are you married? Do you have kids? Do you own a home, et cetera? Then you'll be shown results immediately. And then we will show you the plan that we think would best suit your needs. And then once you get started with any plan you choose, it's very easy to complete. It goes one question at a time. You're able to review at the end your legally valid state-specific documents, which you can either download from your own home or we can ship them straight to you. And then if you have any questions along the way, 
um, use our chat function that's on our website and you'll be directly connected with one of our member success experts like Jason, who has been answering all your questions today. And then once you've um, chosen the plan that you want, you don't really need much to get started. I promise it's not as scary as you think. Some basic information like your name, your spouse's um, and your kids' full legal names and birthdays, an idea of who you would might want to act as guardian for your younger children, if applicable, who you'd want to appoint as your executor or trustee, how you would like your assets distributed, so what percentage or to whom. You can also include specific assets like jewelry or a passed down stamp collection, things like that. Or you can simply state, I want a portion of my entire estate to go to specific individuals. And then lastly, you'll just need the names of financial institutions where you hold any accounts, as well as addresses, addresses to any real estate you may own. Um, and if you own a business, obviously the name of your business. You won't need anything like your social security numbers, bank account numbers, online passwords, real estate titles, business ownership paperwork. Like I said, it's not as complicated and scary as most people assume. And if you're not ready to get started, but you just want to learn a little bit more about estate planning, try to figure out what's best for you, you can still head to trustandwill.com and look for the little learn button at the top of our page where you'll find a wealth of information about estate planning, hundreds of articles um, and resources that can help you decide which option is best for you. And like I mentioned, we always have representatives that you can chat with to learn more about the process. And with that, you guys have all officially completed Estate Planning 101. I really appreciate your time today and hope you learned at least one new thing about estate planning or at least have a better understanding of why it's so important. And for attending today, we're offering a 15% off um, of any estate plan of your choice. So simply visit calcoastcu.org slash estate dash planning to receive your discount. Thank you all again. I hope you have a great rest of your day and I will pass it back over to Christine. Thank you so much, Molly, for the valuable information. That was so good. I think that's going to apply to everybody on this call for sure. And thank you so much too, to Jason. I saw lots of questions and he was hard at work answering all of those in the Q&A. Um, I'd like to open it up to Tim. Uh, Tim, do you have any CalCoast product information that you'd like to share? Well, first of all, uh, thank you, um, Trustee Wills, for uh, participating. Um, one thing, if you do want to take advantage of uh, we do have a special promotion since you will have to become a member to get the 50% discount. Uh, we will provide a $100 uh, deposit in your savings account if you do become a member. Um, basically, you just need to set up a, a check in and savings and uh, set up a paperless statement and set up uh, online banking uh, to get the $100. So a very easy process. So hopefully you'll take advantage of uh, Trust in Wales, and um, uh, you will also receive a hundred dollar uh, deposit into your savings account if you do become a member. Uh, you do have to contact me because I do have to put a special code on your account so you get the hundred dollar uh, uh, benefit. And um, my email address is t f e r i a at calcocu.org. Uh, or you can call me at 858-518-3199. So whatever's easiest. Um, thank you for participating. Great. Thank you so much, Tim. And before we conclude, I'd like to remind everyone that we'll be continuing our, continuing our monthly webinar series next month on Wednesday, September 14th. So mark your calendars. We have a really great topic. It's cybersecurity awareness, keeping your financial data safe. And you can register now on uh, calcocu.org. And as always, we're available for questions and assistance. Please reach out to Tim or visit a branch. Give us a call or message us on social media and we will be sure to respond to you. And we, again, I wanna reiterate what Molly said. We hope you learned something new today and thank you so much for joining and enjoy the rest of your day. We'll see you next month.